they're permitted to do that through this code. <laughs> so incremental repair is in there. It's, it's kind of a pain to track all that. Uh, but it allows people to have options when money is an issue for them, incremental repair. So uh, you guys may at some point be helping to design certain systems that help to... The bottom line for an incremental repair is eliminate the immediate public health nuisance, the sewage surfacing on the ground, and find a way to do that and then, and then add to that system over time to make sure that you have a functional system at the end of a period of however many years, three years or whatever it is. So it's an option. There are sometimes it's not an option. Third acre lot, off lot discharge, how are you gonna incrementally repair that system? You gotta put the off lot in, you gotta put all the components in. So there are some times it can't be done, but there are some times it can, and that tool's available for homeowners. Uh, I won't even mention this, this next couple bullets are for us, so nothing to really concern you. Um, again, designers, same thing. Same as soul scientists, we can't register designers. Uh, but they do have a level of competencies that they gotta be able to maintain. They gotta know what they're doing, how to lay out topography, how to identify all the appropriate things in the property, how to design a system, how to use the HLLR, the SILR, to properly design a system. And it has to be flagged. The system area has to be flagged by the designer. Uh, tanks, pumps, and controls. Uh, the tankage size hasn't changed from what you currently are aware of. Uh, I did notice, though, that uh, in the past, there was, in the past, in our old rules, we had a uh, two-bedroom minimum sizing on a system, which is 240 gallons per day. In 07, that was removed. Now it's back in. Minimum size system, 240 GPD, two-bedroom house. There aren't going to be any one-bedroom houses. That's bottom line there. The... Uh, Minimum tank size has stayed the same, and they added this one piece. Believe it or not, uh, tanks do get installed unlevel. <laughs> I see some eye rolling going on. It, you all know it happens. I've seen tanks going backwards. I'm not sure uh, why that is, but uh, you know the inlet's higher than the outlet usually. You can measure it down and figure that out. It happens. Special filtration. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There you go. So anyway, tanks have to be installed level and they have to be put in properly. Uh, there must have been a problem, that's why they put that in there. Uh, I mentioned previously that there's a series of appendices that are in the code, but I wanna make you aware of what some of these systems look like. Um, low pressure sand filter. Don't get your hopes up. It's not something you can discharge off lot right now. So low pressure sand filters are in there and it's similar in design to the old sand filters you're accustomed to, but there are some serious differences. Uh, one of which is they're lined. It's a lined excavation. Uh, you can get a one foot soil depth credit for the use of a low pressure sand filter and there is a non-electric option. So this is basically a demand dosed sand filter that can be used like a flout or siphon or a pump. And all you get out of it is a one foot soil depth credit. But those people who have an aversion to using aerators, maybe you can use that. A time dose sand filter, what you get out of this is a two foot soil depth credit. So the only difference between the previous one I mentioned is first one's demand dose, this one's time dose. We already talked about the benefits of time dosing, and it does treat the effluent better when you put time to it. All right, soil absorption. This is kind of the meat and potatoes because this is the stuff we're most commonly doing out there. Uh, what are we trying to accomplish? We want to lower, lower the risk and have the right tools available. In the law, there was a section that talked about <coughs> low, moderate, high risk environments and how, you, how do you work with all of these different environments. So we want to decrease the risk, and have tools available for people. So what, what do you mean by risk? Well, the risk of sewage reach, reaching the surface water or groundwater without pre-treatment. That's, that's what we're trying to prevent, the risk we're talking about. So uh, what this code has done is established, and this can be a little bit confusing, so I'll try to be careful to explain this properly. 
you all probably now are familiar with VSD, <coughs> vertical separation distance. Way back in the day, the only vertical separation distance we cared about was distance to groundwater and distance to bedrock, four feet. That was it. Now, as it was in 07, we have vertical separation distances to soil limiting layers, seasonal perch water table, highly permeable materials, all that other stuff that wasn't done previously in the old code. So see if you can follow me on this. This first statement, establish a baseline vertical separation distance uh, of 18 inches and a minimum in situ native soil depth of 8 inches. What that is, is that's a catch-all. Everything else after this is an exception. So what they did is if we didn't put you an exception in here, it goes there. So if I didn't mention it in the exceptions, then it falls in that one. And some of the exceptions are the ones that we really care about because those are the ones we're most commonly dealing with. So most of the time, as installers and designers, you're going to care more about the exceptions than that general statement at the top. So exceptions. Soils defined as highly permeable material within the infiltrated distance cannot be used to meet vertical. Well, that's, uh, that's really in addition to the first bullet. We can't say that uh, this highly permeable material is usable for treatment of, of, of effluent and uh, is part of that, that distance, that treating distance. Okay, here's the exception. This is what I really want to get into. First exception. If the minimum required vertical separation distance of 36 inches uh, and the minimum required in situ soil uh, thickness of 12 inches within the infiltrative distance shall be required when the following site conditions are present. Fractured and karst bedrock, groundwater, or an aquifer. Bottom line, the first exception, groundwater or bedrock, just like we just said, has to be 36 inch separation off that. That's a decrease from the old days of four feet. So now we're at 36 inches for those two things. First exception, 18 inches doesn't apply to bedrock and groundwater. Or other, and they put in the other, or other conditions that the soil evaluator might find as a high risk environment. So what they did is, if, if you read, I don't know how, how many people actually read the first and second drafts? That's what I thought, <laughs> two or three. <laughs> The first code was confusing because it said, here's high risk, here's medium risk, here's low risk, and it was confusing. What they basically did here, it just kind of, in my opinion, cleaned it up and made it easier. And basically said, groundwater bedrocks 36 inches and any other condition with high permeability that's going to have direct access to groundwater <coughs> or bedrock. So that's the first exception. Exception number two, and is the most important one that we care about in Stark County and probably throughout the state of Ohio. And that seasonal water table, that is usually the thing that catches us on most systems. And what they've done is basically said, the Board of Health can adopt a uh, vertical separation distance anywhere from the range of six inches to 18 inches. So we, or and every other Board of Health in this state can adopt some number between 6 and 18. Why 6 and 18? State legislature said you can't go any lower than 6, you can't go any higher than 18, pick somewhere in the middle. That's the state legislature. However, what they did in the code is they put a default. If you don't adopt something, it's 12. So uh, every board of health out there will either adopt something or they'll go directly to 12 and they'll just live with 12. And that is our department's perspective will just, you know, we were discussing uh, beforehand exactly where we want to be with this number, and 12 was the number we, we uh, were talking about, and lo and behold, the default is 12, so we're happy with that. So, the seasonal perch water table, let's, let's make some comparisons, because this really relates to cost. Then we have an example where the seasonal perch water table is at 24 inches down. Well, today you all know that either you've got to put an aerobic treatment system in and go 12 inches deep with your trench. All right, so you've got 12 inch separation here. 
profile of your trench is eight. Then you've got four, I know you can't read, I apologize, four inches of native soil that can be covered, and you're gonna have to add a little bit more cover to get your total of six inches, right? That's, that's what we see a lot of times with the current standard. 24 inch required separation, many of you use an aerator to get 12, and then you can go in the ground 12 inches or so. Some of you may choose to do a mound, and that mound has a minimum of six inches of sand required, so that's another way you can meet that requirement. Well, with the way this is being proposed, this is now 12. Now you can immediately go in the ground 12 inches without an aerator. Done. Still have a little bit of film material. And guess what? They also took out the need for equal distribution after an aerator. So no longer do you have to have a pump or some other device for equal distribution if you're using one, and if you're not using one, you can be 12 inches off. Can you see the cost savings already? It's a big difference. You're getting rid of a lot of fill material in many cases. You're getting rid of aerobic treatment units, and many times you're getting rid of pumps. So uh, it, it's really, if, if I'm to summarize what a lot of this will do in the practical world, this is probably in the middle of the road between where we were in 06 in this county and where we are right now from the 07 regulations we're currently operating under. We're going to probably have a middle of the road. Prices will come down uh, because of those various uh, technical things that are mentioned in this code. Uh, the other thing uh, that I should mention here is if you use an aerobic treatment unit, they're proposing the minimum separation distance be six inches off of seasonal perch water table. So let's say you want to get in the ground deeper, you have some reason to need an aerobic treatment unit or other pre-treatment device uh, or sand filter like we mentioned earlier. Uh, the minimum separation will be six inches is what they're proposing. They're also proposing that if you go less than six, you are going to get into some LPP designs at that point. So we'll see how that all falls out. That's a little bit different than what you're reading right here, but we had conversations at the regional meeting that sounded like ODH was kind of going in a direction of adopting some of that stuff. As of right now, the draft code does not have a default for this piece, but I expect to see one, and I expect it to see it six inches. So, any questions about that? <coughs> yeah, we'll take a, yeah, Paul. Go back to where we're allowed to do the off lots back to the um, trenches. Yeah. Are they going to have to they may have to fail back over again in 10 years. Are they better off, the homeowners, to keep the NPDES permit valid? That's a good question, Paul. I don't know. If it was me, I'd want off of the dumb thing. Uh, but we have to get to go back and your system fails. I, I don't know. You're probably going to have to meet the NPDES standards at that time. I don't expect it to be drastically different, but. You know, because these NPDES permits are the same as what commercial wastewater plants are operating at. So they're going to keep them the same. It may not be terribly difficult to get back on one if you need it. There about the public health nuisance standard for uh, E. coli. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and read sections of 3718.011. Uh, what that is, is that is law, not rules that says conditions under which a sewage treatment system is causing a public health nuisance. So if you meet any of these criteria, then you've fallen into that public health nuisance threshold. We're required to make it be corrected. Uh, if you don't fall into this category, we're not required to make you repair or replace your system. Remember how I earlier said that if a system's functioning properly and so forth and so on, this is what defines properly. So I'll go ahead and read to you some of, some of this. Uh, if the sewage treatment system is not operating properly due to a missing component, incorrect settings, or a mechanical or electrical failure, the aerator's not running. There you go. Lift pump's not running. Uh, that, that is a public health nuisance. There is a blockage in a known sewage treatment system component or pipe that causes a backup of sewage or effluent affecting the treatment process or inhibiting proper plumbing drainage. Sewage backing up into a house, public health nuisance, um, and, and other things along that line. 